prefer it with, I prefer it with projector view. Oh, so I know the next. Okay. Um, apologies for the delay, and uh, welcome everybody to this public lecture organised by the IIC Quantum Technology Initiative. As you know, IIC Quantum Technology Initiative is a multidisciplinary um, initiative which is partnering with the Quantum Research Park and uh, to create a quantum technology ecosystem in IIC. And today's public lecture, uh, which will be given by Professor Sir Michael Pepper, uh, will be one of the uh, lectures in tune with the mandates of the Quantum Initiative in IIC. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mike uh, for uh, in front of this audience, those here and also those uh, joining us online. Uh, Professor Sir Michael Pepper was appointed uh, to the Pender Chair of Nanoelectronics at UCL on January 1st, 2009. He works on joint projects between UCL Electronic and Electrical Engineering at the Lond and, the, and the London Center for Nanotechnology, focusing on research into quantum properties of advanced uh, semiconductor nanostructures, fundamental terahertz technologies and their applications. Professor Pepper pioneered the study of low dimensional electron gas systems uh, and the associated quantum effects. And his career has encompassed both academic and industrial sectors. As you know, this is one of the key aspects of even quantum technology, where you connect uh, the academic developments and the industrial applications simultaneously. Uh, he was elected uh, as to the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2009. The Royal Academy of Engineering promotes the engineering and technological welfare of the UK. Its uh, fellows comprise the UK's most eminent engineers who provide leadership and expertise for the organization's activities, which focus on the relationships between engineering technology and quality of life. Sir Michael was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1983 as a result of his research into the properties of semiconductor structures, and then he was a fellow of Trinity College uh, in 1982. Uh, he was a professor of the physics at the University of Cambridge uh, until 2009. He has been awarded the Hughes Medal and the Royal Medal of the Royal Society and gave the Society's Beckerian Lecture. He was awarded the first Mott Medal of the Institute of Physics, as well as the Guthrie Gold Medal, and the Gold Medal for Business and Innovation. He was awarded the Europhysics Prize of the European Physical Society, and the Dirac Medal for the, of the University of New South Wales and the Australian Institute of Physics. He, was, he has presented many named lectures, uh, and received a knighthood in 2006 in the New Year's uh, Honours uh, list for services to physics. In addition to his academic work, Sir Michael uh, was the founding managing director of the Toshiba Research in Cambridge, uh, which has pioneered the commercial development of quantum technologies and also was uh, co-founder and present scientific director of TerraView, which is commercializing terahertz technology. With this introduction, I would request Professor Sir Michael Pepper to give you this public lecture. Mike. Oh. Oh. Thank you very much, Rindam, uh, for the talk, uh, for the introduction, uh, which uh, I must say I didn't quite recognize myself, but thank you very much. That's good. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here to give this lecture which I understand is going to be an uh, interdisciplinary. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that's better. You can hear me now, can you, at the back? Yeah? No? Good. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, which uh, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I understand this is an interdisciplinary audience, so I'm going to start off actually by uh, essentially looking at the first principles 
and then actually progressing from there. So um, if you're a physicist, uh, please bear with me because the interesting bits may come about halfway or towards the end after I've actually gone through the uh, foundations. So essentially, what I'm going to talk about are effects which you might describe to be uh, almost not quite macroscopic quantum effects, but when one actually sees uh, quantum effects uh, in the laboratory, even though experiments are often performed at very low temperatures, there are examples which I will show of room temperature effects. And normally, as we know, essentially uh, these quantum effects tend to be averaged out or you basically adopt approximations to the effective mass, to the electron charge, and so on, which work very well. So first of all, interesting point is that the electrons, of course, charged particles, uh, defined in 1897, uh, and uh, obviously they are found orbiting around the atom and are responsible for chemical bonds, and indeed you might say responsible for the science of chemistry. Uh, and the quantum mechanics was uh, developed uh, to actually um, define the energy levels and explain the energy differences between the levels of an atom. And the key a breakthrough, as you know, was Planck's theory of radiation, in which he defined a constant, which little h, known as Planck's constant, and the energy of, of a level, of an orbit of the electron going around the nucleus. So here we have as a nucleus, and there we have electron orbits going around it, and uh, Max Planck wanted to calculate what would happen if an electron jumped between different levels, and he defined it in terms of an energy is his constant times frequency. He didn't believe it had any significance, actually, uh, and was very surprised when it was found to be one of the most important constants in the universe, and that was first proposed by Einstein. And uh, so the electrons within a solid show quantum mechanical effects and are responsible for carrying electricity. And in a solid, a metal that is, there are literally billions of them, trillions of them actually, hundreds of trillions. Uh, and they move around very rapidly, having collisions with themselves, with defects, with impurities, and so on. Ah. What is this? So can we use uh, solid state systems, solid systems, with all these electrons buzzing around, colliding with each other, colliding with impurities, colliding with the uh, defects in the lattice, can we use them to study quantum mechanics and individual electronic behavior? And the answer is yes, we can. And that's what I'm going to discuss. So first of all, you're accustomed to measuring electrical resistance. Yeah, you do that, actually. Uh, in school at age 16, 17 or so, that measure resistance, that they, you pass a current through a metal or some object, uh, and uh, you measure the voltage across it, and the resistance is the voltage over the current, and its unit is ohms. And, uh, but it may surprise you to know that Planck's constant H over the square of the electron charge, little e, which is the charge on the individual electron, h upon e squared has got dimensions of ohms and it's roughly h upon e squared approximately 25.5 kilo ohms and that is the key actually that is known as the quantum of resistance very often I'm going to show you results in which we have h upon 2 e squared half of that in terms of resistance or in terms of conductance which is usually more often um, derived or uh, applied in um, experimental results, it's 2e squared upon h conductance, the reciprocal of resistance. The 2 stands for spin degeneracy. So each electron contributes h upon e squared to the resistance, so they're in parallel, so it's a half h upon e squared or 2e squared upon h in conductance. That is a very important point, and we'll see what happens soon. So Ohm's, this is Ohm's law of e equals resistance times current, Ohm's second law, well, it's just the reciprocal. I'm not quite sure why it's referred to as a law, but anyway, it is. And so, essentially, resistance is defined in terms of the resistivity. Now, what, one of the uh, systems that I shall be referring to, in fact, most of them, actually, are two-dimensional systems in which everything is flat. There's no third dimension. Here, basically, we walk around in two dimensions because 
we find it very difficult to go up in the third dimension. You can jump, but you don't get very far. You can go up in an aeroplane, of course, to 30, 35,000 feet or so. That's still quite a small distance, actually, compared to how far you can go in the flat. So these are nanoscale systems, but very small. What is a nanoscale system? Well, it depends on what you're defining, and I will come on to that, actually. So the conductance is just I upon V, the current over the voltage, and we express it in ohms per square. That is, if we had a square in which the width is the same as the length, that is ohms per square, uh, and that is G. And that will be a vital concept in the measurements. Now, one of the topics which is of great interest and has come along mainly as a result of the techniques used by the semiconductor industry. The semiconductor industry, of course, is a vast industry, part of information technology, and they have developed techniques for making very small transistors. As you know, if you buy a complex chip, these days it contains hundreds of billions of transistors. I mean, so many it's impossible to actually test them individually. They just test units of the chip. And mesoscopic devices are those devices in which here is the definition from the Greek, which are intermediate between micro and macro. We live in the macro world. Everything is macroscopic, you know, large a large compared to atoms. Atoms, of course, are micro, uh, very small. But meso is midway between micro and macro. Now, the interesting point is that if we have fluctuations or changes, then in the, in the macroscopic world, they are averaged out. We average them out, basically. If you take traffic flow, for example, you're calculating the average speed. It's an average. You can go slower, you can go faster, but it's an average. And that is the, the macroscopic world. Micro, you'll look at it individually for very small times, very small distances. Uh, meso is intermediate. So it concerns the physical description of systems that are intermediate. There. So what are the general features of it? Well, basically, it's large numbers of particles but not such a large number that we have to average out the properties. So large in this instance can be 7, 8, or 9, where each individual particle, the collisions of each individual particle and its properties can be assessed individually. If you've got a billion or so, then you measure the average properties. And you can, under the right circumstances, see the quantum character of the particles. Now, of course, it is fundamental to quantum mechanics that the electrons will behave as waves, probability waves, that you can calculate the probability of finding an electron somewhere, uh, and that is known as the wave function. The square of the wave function is a probability. And because of this, you can investigate phenomena such as interference and diffraction and also the energy and the many-body effects. By many-body effects, I, what I mean is that very often in physics and indeed chemistry for that matter, we, we look at the properties of one electron and we ignore all the other hundreds of millions around it. And we get a long way with that. Uh, and if we are forced to the dignity of numerical simulations, uh, then you, we just average out the properties of all those around it. And but that sometimes is not good enough, and in the mesoscopic world is not good enough. You have to take into account the individual electrons and how they affect each other, and they, those are called many-body effects. Now, you can make the mesoscopic devices in two ways. As one is a top-down, which I'm going to discuss, in which we use the techniques of the industry for microfabrication, for nanoscale patterning, Another one, which is perhaps more chemistry, more chemically oriented, is actually self-assembly of particles, almost colloidal particles, self-assembly. Very often, actually, you see the uh, advertisements for television sets which work with quantum dots. There you made by uh, this uh, bottom-up approach, actually, in which there are really large numbers of them, and so the average property is, is used, uh, and very good as well they are. Now, if we, we investigate transport, by transport we mean electrons moving around in solids, uh, 
that's right, electron transport. And now it depends upon the dimension of the sample, whether we have a nanostructure or we don't have a nanostructure. So the dimension can be L. And we define the elastic mean free path. The elastic mean free path is the mean free path an electron will travel between scattering events. And it's elastic because if, for example, you look at a billiard table or a snooker table or a pool table, whichever game you prefer, or none for that matter, then a ball hits the side of the table and it comes off. And it basically, there's a, essentially, it will move the table, of course, but the table is moved by uh, fractions of a micron. It's actually not possible to, to notice it. So it comes off, actually, and it comes off elastically. Essentially, the energy of the uh, billiard ball or snooker ball is more or less the same. So you can apply, basically, conservation of linear momentum in one direction. So if this is small than the dimension of the sample, then many elastic scattering events occur. And this is called diffusive scattering because the electron bounces off uh, the impurities and it's essentially, in mathematical terms, a random walk, which you will have, have probably done in mathematics. Uh, and essentially, it's diffusive. You know, you, the mean distance gone L squared is equal to the square root of the diffusion coefficient times the time. If this is larger than the dimension of the sample, electrons can traverse the system without any scattering. This is called ballistic. It's like bullets coming out of a gun, basically. They just travel in a straight line. And that is the regime we are going to discuss today. Uh, and if L is uh, comparable to the size of the uh, sample, uh, so which is a little, or, or to the elastic scattering length, rather, L subscript E, then it's quasi-ballistic. It's basically ballistic, which is smeared out. Now, one of the uh, workhorses of the uh, experimental systems to study these effects is the two-dimensional electron system or the two-dimensional electron gas. And there are many of them now. The first one, actually, which we looked at, uh, which everybody looked at, was discovered by the IBM group back in the 1960s. And that was the inversion layer of the silicon MOS device. Those of you familiar with silicon devices, the MOS, or the field effect transistor, uh, essentially is a capacitor. The electrons are drawn to the surface by a voltage, and they occupy a very narrow region of space. And if they occupy a very narrow region of space, then energy levels become quantized. That is quantum mechanics. It's a particle in the box even though the uh, confining potential is more triangular. Nevertheless, it's, it can be described by quantum mechanics and the energy level is calculated. Now, the advanced techniques of um, growth of semiconductors, the gallium arsenide, uh, and I'm taking this because this is a very good system which shows very strong quantum effects. It's grown by molecular beam epitaxy. That's very high grade, almost perfect evaporation, frankly. Uh, and it's very important, but it's a, it's a science in its own right. We put on top of it aluminium gallium arsenide. Aluminium gallium arsenide has the same lattice parameter as gallium arsenide. It's an alloy. And uh, because of this, it forms an almost perfect interface. If the lattice parameter is different, then the atoms are at different distances apart, and there's stress at the interface, and one can get buckling and defects formed to relieve that stress. Uh, the interesting thing is that it's got a band gap which is bigger than that of gallium arsenide. And as far as we're concerned, we're not discussing band gaps. What it means is that the, the lowest energy electron in the aluminium gallium arsenide is higher than the lowest energy electron level in gallium arsenide. So if I've got electrons in the conduction band free to move in the, it's known as the L gas in the trade actually, it's quicker than saying aluminium gallium arsenide. If it's, if it's at, they're at a higher level, then they will fall down into the gallium arsenide. And so we get an excess of electrons in the gallium arsenide. And because they've gone from the L gas, that will be positively charged and will push them at the interface. And so we get a, a two dimensional electron gas here. Where they're doped with silicon. Silicon is put as an impurity because the electrons are attached to it <coughs> and very weakly and they become free and fall into the gallium arsenide. Now, the beauty of this system is quite simple, really. 
it is this, that normally in a solid uh, we have positive uh, ions, positive charges and electrons and obviously the two must add up because there must be zero charge in the system and so at, particularly at low temperatures uh, the electrons are scattered by the impurities. Well they're always scattered by the impurities but at low temperatures we can freeze out all the other sources of vibration and they're scattered by the impurities. Now, in this system, which is called modulation doping, by the way, the dopants are separated because we dope the algas and then we stop some distance from the interface. They are a long way away. The electrons fall into the gallium arsenide. So there's nothing to scatter them. They are so far away from the impurities which give rise to them that they're just free to move. And they can move tremendous distances. They can go millimetres before having a collision. So if we're studying quantum effects, this is what we want absence of disorder and then we can go ahead and pattern the and squeeze these electrons into any desired shape and that is the secret of how quantum measurements are performed in solids nothing to scatter the electrons perfect environment quantum effects can dominate and we by means of applying voltages and fields we can manipulate the electrons according to whatever we want to do and that's basically what this talk is all about. So this is actually what I've just been saying. Uh, oops. So here, this is the interface between... There's the, this is just on top, actually. This is just a capping layer on top. It has no other purpose. This is the gal, al aluminium gallium arsenide. It's called n-type because it's got the donors in, which give rise to free electrons. So this is completely pure... The electrons are created here, they fall into there, and they create a two-dimensional electron gas here. They're flattened against the interface. And this is the voltage, you see. It's known as a heterostructure. They're pulled towards the interface by the charges here, or by a metal gate. It's called a gate. We put a piece of metal there and a positive voltage on it, we pull up these electrons. Or if we apply a negative voltage, we get rid of them. So this is actually the part of the matter, really. Uh, this is actually, this is a, a, a very old plot, actually. It's a bit out of date. Uh, forget about this. This is just what I've been talking about. This is the mobility of the electron. The mobility is proportional to how far the electron goes before it has a collision with an impurity. So that's all. This is just an indication of the perfection of the material. Uh, this actually was... 1978. This is what, if you didn't have any modulation doping, this is what you'd have. Very low mobility here, a lot of scattering. Now, if now as you come up, you see 1978 there, it was about 20,000 or so. In 1999, it was 10 million. So that's quite a, an achievement. Today, it's actually gone up to about 50 million. Uh, and this requires very dedicated equipment, uh, a lot of attention paid to cleanliness. Uh, but it's, it can be done. And there are, particularly in um, Princeton and the Weizmann Institute, uh, very high, and Purdue, a very high mobility layers are, are produced. So we're going to talk now about forming a one-dimensional quantum wire because this is an important quantum effect. What we do here is imagine that we have, this is the purple or the blue depending how it comes out, actually, is the two-dimensional electron <coughs> gas. And if we put these are metal strips or gates on the surface, if I apply a positive voltage there, then I get rid of the elect a negative voltage, sorry, which is repulsive to the electrons, we get rid of them. And we just have this little constriction of electrons there. If I make it even more negative, then we get rid of them entirely. So this is a narrow channel, often called a quantum wire or, po or quantum point contact. It's basically very narrow. We can control the, the width of it. And typically, in experimental purposes, uh, we, we go between zero and about a micron or so. To give you an indication of how small a micron is, uh, the diameter of a typical human hair is about 100 microns. So we're talking about one hundredth of a human hair.
Now, basically, we have a quantum particle in the box because we are confining the electron. And uh, without wishing to go too much into this, uh, this is the energy against momentum, uh, which is a parable, uh, a, par a parabola. Uh, and here we have the wave function. This is the wave function is what we calculate for the individual energy levels. And that's a half sign, that we have a sign, and so forth, so forth. Uh, and basically, it's like a particle in the box. And to find the probability of having an electron, we square it. So you can see here, <coughs> the electron is, tends to be found in the middle, which is very reasonable. Here, it's actually at this something like one quarter of the way from this side and then three quarters and then here it's like this and so on and so forth and um, of course classically we don't have quantum uh, effects so classically the electron could be found anywhere within this parabola this confinement due to the voltage from these split gates here it actually forms a parabola potentials like that now classically it can be anywhere and of course if you've got large numbers of these nodes, uh, then you square them, it does approximate to the electron being anywhere. So essentially, large quantum number approximates to classical physics, which is very reasonable. So what happens now, if we squeeze this, then what we get is, as each energy level, we have discrete energy levels, as they pass through the Fermi energy, they lose their electrons. You see what happens here? See, they start off below the Fermi level. The Fermi level, of course, is uh, uh, basically below that we have electrons and above it we don't. So as they come up, as we squeeze this, this is the confinement potential here. We see we, we're squeezing it and we're pushing up these levels because the energy depends upon the one over the distance squared. So we push them up and you see they change color. That's because they've lost their electron. Up they come, you see they're blue, and now they become red. They've lost their electron. Now this just repeats uh, indefinitely. So we can control the occupation of the levels. So at one dimension, 1D, what we have actually is the, we have a narrow constriction, and we start off with two dimensionality, which is that the thickness of the electron gas is very small, very small indeed. Uh, compared to the, the wavelength. Every particle has a wavelength, of course, and this is small compared to the wavelength. Uh, and it's small, of course, compared to any scattering length. Uh, and because we can control the width of it, the width of it becomes small compared to any other length. So it's only free to change its momentum going down. And that's what's meant by one-dimensionality. Now, in order to, to show you the uniqueness of one-dimensionality, uh, we have to define some quantum topics, and this is the so-called density of states. The density of states is the number of allowed states we can have as a function of energy, or the number of allowed electrons at a particular energy. Now, of course, one of the characteristics of, or the basic results of quantum theory is that you can only have one electron in a particular energy state. Uh, in fact, you've got two in if they're opposite spin, because the opposite spins, they're not in the same state. But you can't have any more than that. And that's Fermi Dirac statistics, which determines electrons in the systems. And what you get is the density of states here, which we call, it rises as a function of energy. In other words, the more states, the, more, the greater the energy, the more states you can pack in. That's three dimensions, it's a parabola. Two dimensions, it becomes constant, and every time you get a new level, you get a jump. Now, the interesting thing about one dimension is that it actually drops. As you push up the energy, there are fewer states to put the electrons into. So, this is unique. So, as we go up in energy, the number of electrons at a particular energy gets less and less and less as we go up. But, of course, the velocity goes up. Now, one of the characteristics of um, ballistic transport is that we have to develop new techniques for calculating the conductivity. And it's very simple, actually. It's just really just the number of electrons at a particular energy times the velocity of that energy. Uh, and you just integrate it over the total number. Uh, now, the point is that the, when you calculate the density of states, you find it actually goes as 1 over the velocity. 
times fundamental constants. And if you multiply that by the velocity, you just get a fundamental constant. And that's the remarkable thing about a one-dimensional level. The conductivity is a basic constant of nature. And it turns out that it's actually 2e squared upon h, where 2 is the spin. Lift the spin degeneracy, and it's e squared upon h. I should mention that supposing now we have a quantum dot, the electron's completely confined, then there's just a single energy level. Nothing can be changed until we go to the next energy and we get a whole series of spikes. And this is very interesting. So the 1D conductance given by quantum, it, each spin level is h upon e squared. And that arises from a cancellation of the density of states and the velocity. And it's a unique characteristic of one dimensionality. <coughs> now, this was known way back. But the thing was, the technology of investigating this was not known at all. And it was first, um, experiments were first carried out in 1988, and it was shown actually that this is what happens. <coughs> this is the uh, split gate technology was first developed in 1985, uh, but not for the ballistic regime. The ballistic regime was 1988. And you can see that what happens is, this is the gate voltage. So it becomes very negative here, and basically, when it's very negative, we just pinch this off. There's no electrons in there at all. As it becomes less negative, this constriction in here becomes wider and wider, and so the allowed energy levels go up. Remember that diagram showing the energy levels? As we narrow it, they go above the Fermi energy, and of course, the converse is true. As we widen it, the energy levels fall below the Fermi energy. Every time another level falls below, the conductance goes up by 2e squared upon h. And that's what you see. It's actually, the physics of it is very simple, but the technology of it took a, a huge amount of effort to develop, actually, and only came about as a result of all the advances in the semiconductor industry. This is what happens if we basically look at it as g. Uh, g is uh, the uh, quantum of conductance, 2e squared upon h. So what happens is here, the channel is very wide, and we, we're measuring these regions here and here. As we increase its resistance, so what happens is the conductance drops and we start to get these, and you blow them up and you get these steps. You can see about 30 steps in the best case, actually, which is remarkable, really, because there's no disorder. You can see 30 distinct quantum levels. <coughs> now, this shows a multiplicity of them. This is taken, actually, with... Um, so this shows you the result in terms of G, the conductance here against the squeezing voltage, the gate voltage. This is the voltage which squeezes them. You can see here, this is actually in a magnetic field. And that's one, two, in units of two E squared upon H and three. This is taken at low temperature, 100 millikelvin, in a dilution refrigerator. And what we do is we apply the magnetic field, which actually... Uh, lifts the spin degeneracy. So we no longer have two. You see, we get a one. This is now an e squared upon h. Uh, and then it's a two. And then and we start to get a three and a four. And basically, we get a pattern because some of the levels go up in energy and some come down and they overlap. Most important thing I draw to your attention is that we now get the in high magnetic field. We now see the full uh, quantum of resistance at e squared upon h. Now, that experiment cost an awful lot of money because, first of all, the molecular beam epitaxy had to be uh, purchased. Uh, various labs do this. Uh, and the, the prox proximate cost of those is about a million pounds. You have to measure in a dilution refrigerator at very low temperatures. And the approximate cost of those, by the time you've set up the lab with all the measuring equipment, is another million or so. And so then you've got to make the samples in the clean room and then you require all the equipment there to do that. Let's chuck in another half a million or so. So you're talking about a very expensive experiment. Now, once you understand the science of it, you can then do it very cheaply, actually. You can do it at room temperature in a teaching laboratory, which is being done. I'll just have a drink. What you can do is the fact is that when you make a contact between, let's say, a metal plate and a metal wire which comes down, 
course, you just push it down. But in fact, if you blow this up, the contact, it's very jagged, the end of the metal which comes down. And so if you just touch, then that's basically going to be one atom wide, and then you, you push it down more as two atoms wide, three atoms wide, and so on. And you can see the steps in conductance as you push it down. Another method, which is shown here, is if you take a metal wire, and you, uh, it's at room temperature, of course, and you stretch it, then it breaks. You could do it, attach it to some sort of pulling machine, which basically stretches it at uh, so many uh, inches or centimeters per millisecond, you pull it. And then, as it, it doesn't just break cleanly, first of all, it narrows around a neck. And then it becomes six atoms wide, five atoms wide, four, three, two, one, nothing. And so four atoms wide corresponds to four quantum levels, three, three, and so on. And this is what you see. So it starts off here at zero time. The experiment starts at zero time, and it's actually G naught, which is 2e squared upon h. And you see, it's flat at four. It drops. This is time in milliseconds, so basically the stretching is proportional to the time. It drops like that. It's not exactly on three, but it's not far. For, for something like this, it's not bad at all. Then it comes down. It's not bad for two, and then one, and then basically it snaps. So you can do this with a piece of wire in a simple laboratory for very, very cheaply, actually. No problem. But of course, that comes about because it was all known as a result of the very low temperature experiments. And of course, the, the further investigations do need the low temperatures. One of the interesting uh, topics, which I won't go into, I just want to show you the ability to manipulate the electrons is, if we start off on the right here, this is a line of electrons strongly confined. Supposing we weakly confine them, we decrease the uh, potential which is holding them in place. Now, they repel each other very strongly because they're all negative, so they try and move apart. So they now go like that, a zigzag. And in fact, the distance between this one and that one is less than the distance between that one and that one. So this was the second nearest neighbor before, i.e. number three, and it's now number two, as far as this one's concerned. And eventually, as we actually decrease the confinement even more, they split up into two rows. This is another example. Here you see the potential of confining them. And now you actually uh, release the confinement, and you form this zigzag array, which is under current investigation. So this is actually, um, the, 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 for those who are interested in the basic physics, the exchange interaction, you get many types of exchange interaction, the interactions between, let's say, this one and that one, this one and that one, and so on. It's quite a fertile field. Now, we can also make what people have defined to be an artificial atom, because we are confining the electron in two dimensions uh, before, so it's actually got a one-dimensional freedom. Supposing we cut off the one-dimensionality, so it's now completely enclosed. So you see here the split gates, like that. So supposing we make these so negative, nothing can get through. Nothing can get through here. But now, because this is a bigger distance, we can have a small number of electrons in the middle. This is known as a quantum dot. It blows it up here, you see. Those are the electrons. And here's a gate here, this one. This is called the plunger. Plunging for electrons. It's sort of plumbing of electrons. Uh, and we can, by charging this up, we can change the number of electrons here. Now, the electrons, how do they get in and out? Well, they get in and out by quantum mechanical tunneling. Quantum mechanical tunneling is a property of waves. It's actually a property of a wave that when it encounters an obstacle, there's a reflected wave and a transmitted wave. You, I mean, this, this occurs all over the place. It's just a general property of waves. So if you look in a shop window, then you can see a faint reflection of yourself, and you, get a, you can see in the shop. So you get a transmitted wave and a reflected wave, and that's what you get here. You can get transmission of the electrons through. That's another one there. And every time you get an electron through, you get a spike of current. So these current spikes correspond to an extra electron.
So let's uh, now look at the effect of the application of a strong magnetic field in 2D. The electrons describe a circular motion. The orbital frequency omega is quantized you know, because basically they spin round and they can go at a frequency of omega, 2 omega, 3 omega, so on. And the density of states that collapses into discrete levels separated by this energy h bar omega. And states in the middle of this Landau level are free, but at the edges, basically the edges in energy, not in space, they, they become localized, trapped by impurities. And we're going to see what happens. So essentially, if you've got an impurity here, oh, so these are the allowed levels. So you see here an impurity, you trap an electron around it. But we're dealing now with very high quality material, so we don't have that. These are the allowed levels. Here in the tails, they are subjected to the impurity potential and can be trapped. But the most important thing is this, is actually at the edges. You see in the middle here, we have the electrons spinning around in orbits due to the magnetic field. You know, electrons will go in circles. And at the, here, at the edges, see, they go like that. If you consider this, they're moving like that, so like that. And then they hit it and they come like that. Bump, 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 bump. Now, and similarly, down at the bottom. They're all spinning in the same direction, but whereas these here are not going anywhere, there, they're actually constituting a current going down there and one coming down there. And they're called skipping orbits. And in high purity material, these become localized here, just trapped. Or if we've got a lot of impurities, the localization is even better. And what you will find then is that this is the so-called quantum Hall effect, which has aroused huge interest. Now, supposing we have these electrons like that, supposing they come to an obstacle, then they go around it. You see, they can't be backscattered. They can't go backwards because the orbits are going like that. The only way they can be backscattered is to come down here. But they're not allowed to come down here. This distance could be millimeters. So down there, they're spinning the other way. So this means that it actually they, they constitute a dissipationless current going like that. And that gives rise to the quantum Hall effect. Uh, this is actually just a device we use to measure it. I, I won't go into the details because it's actually... And this is what you see. It's quite remarkable, a step function. This is the whole voltage, which is actually the voltage difference between the two edges. And these edge states constitute a one-dimensional current. And so each one has a conductance of E squared upon H. The strong magnetic field gets rid of the factor of two. So it's exactly the same as the one-dimensional system that we looked at before. Before, we have the conductance is e squared upon h times the number of levels. Here, it's the same. And that's what it does. So in other words, the effect of the magnetic field is to set up a one-dimensional system. But the difference is that there are no correction factors in the quantum Hall effect, no correction factors at all. In the, in the one-dimensional conductance quantization, there can be residual scattering, so it's never quantized very accurately. Here it's quantized as accurately as it's possible to measure. And that can be to one part in 10 to the 10. It's completely accurate. Uh, and uh, there are uh, ma many laboratories who are using it to measure E squared upon H, or E if you want to define H, uh, to extremely high accuracy. And what happens is, if we use a sample with less localization, so now the, the orbits in the middle are actually not so strongly trapped, these plateau regions of constant uh, conductance are become, become narrower. So if we go back here, so, yeah, you see how wide they are, and that's because there's hardly any conduction in the middle of the, all the electrons are trapped except at the edges where they can't be trapped. And so if, if you go to a higher quality, then you see smaller plateaus because the electrons in the middle can conduct and they short out the, the quantized conduction at the edges. And so you can see we actually, in this we can vary this. So spin up and spin down uh, are, 
suppose if this is spin anti-parallel to the magnetic field, it goes up in energy, comes down, and where they cross, all sorts of exchange effects can occur. I think I've probably gone beyond my allotted time. Five minutes, okay. I just want to mention a few other devices which uh, employ uh, mesoscopic physics. A DC bias is very important because we can start to probe the energy spectrum. But the, the, the nice thing about this field is, is that we can manipulate the electrons in the way we want. So finally, we can create what is called an anti-dot. Before we showed a quantum dot, which is that we repel, apart from a small region in the middle, we repel all the electrons around it, but we can do the converse. We can make an anti-dot. We can have a small dot of metal gate on the surface, and we can repel all the electrons underneath it, so we get something like a, a rise in potential here, like that. So the electrons now can't go into this region here, but they go around it. They describe orbits around it, actually. Uh, assume you have a, a, a magnetic field to do so. They will go around it like that. And what happens then is we can apply a small magnetic field uh, and we can trap magnetic flux. And what we will then find is we get this. Each one of these spikes corresponds to an orbit. And the difference in magnetic field is due to the, the quantum of flux. Magnetic field, as you know, is divided up into the smallest changes, the flux quantum. And every time we put a flux quantum into that system here, what happens is they go around, we can get interference effects as they go around. And if you, you think about an electron coming in, and it can, in the absence of a strong field, it can actually go around this, that way, or anti-clockwise, and they can interfere. And that's what happens, actually. You get an interference, and, and every time they interfere, you get a minimum, a maximum resistance, and so on. And each one of those corresponds to a flux quantum quite remarkable. You can actually pick it out like that. And so thank you very much for listening. Do you have questions? Yes. Uh, Professor Hawkins, you Yeah, in principle you can. Yeah, yeah. Most of the work, as you know, is, is basically bringing quantum dots together so you can have a singlet and then you can actually, f uh, or a triplet for that matter, and then you can make a quantum dot molecule. So you could, you could make an anti-dot molecule if you could. But they need a magnetic field always. Always for this, but for the, for the quantum dot uh, molecule, you don't need the magnetic field. I mean, you could obviously it's a multiplicity of states you can address if you've got the magnetic field, but you don't need it, no. So you can actually, by varying the carrier concentration in the form of the wave function in each of the dots, you, you can alter the molecule. Yeah. How can you make them? So what would be uh, readout if you have a double quantum antidote? What will you read? Well, it's, I guess. Personally, I, I don't think you can make a quantum computer from anti from dots for this very reason, <laughs> because there are so many connections. But uh, you recall, actually, that some time ago we developed the, uh, the essentially the detector, which is that if you, you have, uh, let's say, a pinched-off region of a one-dimensional region, which is pinched off, its, its conductance is extremely sensitive to its potential. So if you put an electron into a quantum dot, this actually, the conductance of a 1D region near it will change. Uh, and that means you can actually follow very, very small numbers of electrons in a, in a trapped quantum dot when the current through it is immeasurably small, way too small, 10 to the minus 20 amps. And, but you can follow them because of the fact of the changing potential. Now, you can actually go a little further so you could have a detector near each quantum dot and you then could measure the potential from that and you could see them forming a molecule, and that, that's been done. Okay. But the I mean, basically, it's an experiment in its own right. 
to actually suggest that you can make millions of them, well, I think it's stretching credulity. But I may be wrong, of course. Oh, I didn't know you were here. <laughs> I see. That's right, yeah, that's right, actually, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, it's a good summary. Yeah. There's no, there's no protective symmetry for the quantum point conductance. Quantum hall effects, the same kind of conductances, but they're robust against disorder. Yeah, and you know, using a graphene, where the very light mass, very large separation of the levels, you can see quantum hall at room temperature. Yeah. I mean, not the best quantum, what you can see, I mean, clearly, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you've done it, actually. Yeah. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's probably a basic question, but... Uh, in that Aronov bomb effect, uh, we saw that uh, interference patterns, right? Like, why is it not going to zero? Like, if there's a pi phase difference? Oh, yeah. I mean, in principle, it should. But, uh, I mean, there's always what you might call a background current flow. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in principle, it should. But, uh, yeah, that's the best one can do experimentally. I mean, it, I mean it's quite... Quite remarkable. It works as well as it does, actually. Yeah. But you're quite right. Yeah, it should drop to zero. Yeah. Yeah. Could it be because of the efficiency as well? Sorry. Could it be because of some loss of phase coherence? Yeah. Or there's yeah, there's a residual scattering, phase coherent scattering, or there's also tunneling through. Yeah. Thank you very much.